dropshipper out here smashing it in Dubai. That's when I got my first sale. Um, I think it was £574 I made in the span of 24 hours. And that's when I knew like it has potential. This year, or the first quarter of Q1, it done, I think I've done about half a million revenue. When you don't pay for something, you don't find it as valuable. I could sell the a dropshipping guide on the best thing ever, like how to do everything step by step. And if I put it on YouTube for free, no one would watch it. And if you did watch it, they wouldn't take action. Proximity is power. Like it's massive who you hang around with. Same friends. drinking partners, same guys that go to gaff still four in the morning every weekend and wonder why they, they feel terrible Monday, Tuesday. But if you live life on autopilot, you will drift and you'll wake up at 30, 31, 40 and be like, how did I end up here? Most people are fat. Most people can't bench 100 kg. Most people don't make 10k a month. And it's once you actually do it, you realize how easy it is. The more I do, the more I realize I can do. I landed here um, in January. I got off the flight and I'd made 8.4 thousand pounds in, in sales. And then profit on that is around three and a bit thousand. And so I'd made what would previously be like, I don't know, two or three months salary in a single day. What you're working on is more important than how hard you're working. Because if it was down to hard work alone, people like my mum or my dad would be millionaires, they'd be rich. I really think in terms of like the journey you've been on over the last few years, this story could have gone in so many mm -hmm. different directions. And right now I'm thinking back to pro youth, karate champion, but we're talking today, drop shipper out here smashing it in Dubai. Yeah, so it's like you say, it's been a, a long sort of journey since starting out. Uh, primarily I started in sports, um, football, karate, and now I've made it here, 22 years old. Um, generated seven figures in sales from dropshipping and came full circle. So It's unreal, isn't it? And like when I think about getting to know you, like bumping into each other at David Lloyd in the gym and me being like, what's this young guy up to? Like he's, he's really switched on mm -hmm. and really focused on all these different frameworks you were telling me about and teaching me about. But I had no idea like what you were up to on the side. And I had no idea of the backstory in terms of sports and the level of success that you actually had in that space as well because you get a lot of guys that yeah. flower their backstory don't they and yeah. you know that, that better than most in terms of consuming content but if we go back to like your karate was first wasn't it before football wasn't yeah, it yeah exactly so it yeah, started out in karate um at around the age of six or seven is when i first started out and got let's say heavily involved into that um became a black belt in the span of uh, five years um 16 time scottish karate champion um, in both kata and kamita so kata is like the sort of patterns that you see um, and kamita is obviously fighting so actually one on one um, contact like that so i've done that and um, fought in the european championships um, ended up getting disqualified there on on that one but yeah scottish championship um, and done that However, also, let's say I played football. Um, I played with Partick Thistle, which is a Scottish um, team, and uh, played in their youth academy um, all the way through from the age of, I think it was 12 maybe, up until um, 16, 17 is when I got released. Um, and that dream sort of fell through and left me sort of stranded and tried to follow the path. We are just about of that generation where all the kids in school, if they asked what they wanted to be, they would say footballer probably, particularly in yeah. Glasgow. Nowadays, everyone says like YouTuber, influencer things like that when they're kids but football is such a huge part of glasgow as a city and part of our culture as well for you to be like pursuing that dream and have that taken away what was that like at the time at the time obviously i was young and i'm still young obviously i'm only 22 but i was quite i don't know i was disheartened at the time um because that was always my goal and i always thought the amount of training that i put in as well um, I was putting in all the hours, um, even out with the kind of football. I was uh, training, I was running, I was uh, doing karate, like everything on the side to allow me to actually make it and outwork the competition, which was obviously my teammates at the time. Um, because in football, obviously, the whole team isn't going to make it to the first team. It might only be one person. And so I thought that person should have been me. Um, and I was kind of putting in the work so that it would be me. However, um, yeah, at the time when I got released, it was, it was obviously disheartening. Um, especially because I'm a Partick Thistle fan, like so that was my childhood club, and so when that kind of fell through, um, it was disheartening, and I thought I made that transition where I was kind of in, in limbo for a little bit of what to actually do um, with my life, because I always knew that I wasn't going to go into the 95, um, and entrepreneurship was probably my second calling um, out with for sports. If I look at those days where you were going all in on football, and I've had the privilege of like speaking to you and even speaking to your dad about how dedicated yeah. you were back in those days like the the sprints down at Westerton park, play park where, where, near where we both are, yeah. are, are from and the the fact that you would get the best scores in the bleep test and all that sort of stuff you kept you weren't leaving a lot to chance mm -hmm. and some of those behaviors that I hear about from back then it makes so much sense when I watch how you apply yourself in some of those other areas now and I think many of the guests that I've had in the last four years 
there's always little clues within their childhood and with their behaviours that point to what they might end up doing, yep. albeit not drop shipping, but perhaps applying yourself in a way that's a little bit relentless, would that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Like you said, the skills that you will learn in sort of sports or whatever it is you do, and that all translates into whatever you want to do, whether it's business, drop shipping, Amazon, whatever it is that you can choose, um, but all the kind of skills that I learned there translate. Um, and so sort of the discipline, um, working hard, having a work ethic, showing up early, leaving late, that's all the things that I now do and have done in the drop shipping sort of aspect. And it's allowed me to, like I say, get to the stage I'm at just now where I'm generating around six figures per month in revenue and just under six figures in profit per month. So doing that, that was probably something that allowed me to have the success I'm at today. But that applied to that and also applied to the karate. Um, let's say I, most people, when they see someone at a certain level, whether it be they're making X amount per month or they've achieved some sort of goal, they don't understand the backstory and therefore disregard it as luck. However, if you look at the inputs, what they've done to achieve that, the output makes sense. However, most people don't understand the inputs and just sort of call it luck or fate and kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's cliche, isn't it? But the, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes really, really counts. Mm. And people often look at people as an overnight success. And I think when we first spoke about dropshipping would have been mid 2022. You'd already been in the game for a while. And, it, and we're speaking now in 2024 and you're obviously generating these huge sums and living this lifestyle that is so far away from what you might have been living. That that seems fast, but there's lots of stuff that's happening in the background before your Instagram was more popular, before your TikTok's popping off, and that all counts. But one thing I'm really curious about when it comes to the, the football side of things, you had a lot of success in karate. You were validated as like Scottish champion multiple times, fighting at a European level. What was it about football that you decided to maybe push more in that direction rather than karate? Yeah, so in terms of football being the priority, it was one, probably a monetary aspect. It was, there's money to be made in football. Um, and karate, there's not really, even the fact it's not even in the Olympics. It's not classified as a sport, it's classified as a martial art. Um, and so hence why you won't see it in the, in the Olympics, really. Um, however, yeah, football, let's say there's money to be made in football. However, like you know yourself, in Scotland or even in the UK in general, the only way to make it quote unquote is to be a footballer or sell drugs, <laughs> which is always- In terms a, of that amount of mo yeah, in terms crazy of money. Crazy money, yeah. So it's either football or like I say, that's that's your only option essentially. And starting a business isn't really something that's popular or talked about in Scotland or even in the UK. Um, so I, I would say, I don't even know where I was there. But in terms of like the validation piece of being a footballer, there's a lot to be said for that. Were you exposing yourself to any anything that would have pointed to the type of lifestyle that you live now in your football days? Yeah, so to be honest, like I never actually done it for the money. Even like sort of like I had intrinsic no, me, sort of motivation as to what I wanted to do, um, rather than any external sort of like your mum and dad would say to kids like, "Oh, I'll give you a ten if you score." That was never like that. Never done it for me. I just wanted to be the best, um, for the sake of being the best, and I always had that kind of like mentality that I thought uh, not in a bad way, but I thought I was better than everyone. And I, and if you have that mentality, you need to prove it. And so you need to prove it by putting in the work and that kind of thing. And so I always sort of put in the work so that I'd live up to that expectation of being the best and um, that kind of thing. We were speaking about Atomic Habits this morning before we hit the gym and. The number of people listen to this that listen to my podcast regularly will know that I'm a big fan of that book and it's taught me a lot about how I design my life and how I live. One of the biggest tenets of that is shaping your identity as like who you want to become and who you want to be. But if you don't live up to that in terms of your actions, behaviors, and your habits, then it's like a false perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you go into Thistle or into a karate tournament as I'm the man, I'm gonna smash this, I'm gonna be brilliant at this, you have to do the things in the background that allow you to walk that walk. Otherwise, it is just false ego. And I think ego's got two strands to it. It can drive us to try and fulfill the type of identity that we desire. Or it can be like a crippling thing where we've got like elements of delusion about yeah. ourselves too. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Like you say, constant repetition carries conviction. And so having confidence, if you have nothing to back up, like why you have that confidence, that's delusion. Whereas if you have a track record, of, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. And that's, that's confidence. That's sort of you've done the reps and like the way I look at it is in order to kind of achieve anything and get confidence, it's all about doing the reps. So it's volume and volume is the answer and time is the ingredient. So obviously you need to do the reps, but doing them for long enough because even the right thing in the wrong amount is, isn't going to work out. And so, yeah, I had that confidence because I knew that I'd put in the work. And so I trained extremely hard um, probably even too hard, but 
I knew when I, it came to game day, whether it be like a football match or a cricket tournament or anything, I was ready and I was more prepared. And so I wasn't nervous um, in terms of anything, even in terms of dropshipping just now. Uh, there's a quote that says, I stand here truthfully unafraid, not because of what lies ahead of me, but because of what lies behind me. And so I know that I've probably done more than 10,000 hours now in terms of work that I've put into dropshipping and, and learn everything to do with it. And so I'm not scared if a product dies out or if an ad account gets shut down because I know that I've got the skill set to be able to replicate that sort of success. We're going to get on to some of those challenges you yeah. come up against recently because I think, I think you've really shown your resilience in recent times where things maybe look like they're going like to the moon in a straight in a straight yeah. line like a, a parabolic pumping crypto but there's been peaks and troughs and ups and downs as well and i really like what you're saying in terms of what i've done previously is enabling me to resist what's coming next and like you and i got to know each other in, in, in the gym initially and all the training you do in that period is getting you ready to look a particular way when somebody's like oh bro like how do you get like arms like that or a six pack or whatever and you're like yeah. well i've been training for years and i do this 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 of course i look like this now I didn't look like this when I was in the in the trenches, like building at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Like you say, somebody will ask, oh, how do you get, um, like you say, if we're going to the gym example, how do you get in that shape? Obviously, you're you're an incredible shape yourself. Like someone will ask you, how do, how do I get the same sort of aesthetic as you? And you'll say to them, eat clean and work out. And people will do that, but they'll do it for a week or a day or a month. And they'll say it doesn't work. Whereas they haven't done it long enough, you know what I mean? Not enough volume. You, yeah, you need to give time, time. And so it's the same with dropshipping. Like you say, I might look like a sort of overnight success, um, but it's the same with the Lino Messi one, 19 years to become an overnight success. Like he's put in the work for that long and it's only, it's just like the story of the bamboo. So the bamboo grows and grows and grows and it just springs up obviously out of the ground and it looks like instant. However, it's a lot of work being done in the background in terms of like the mindset or not say building the foundations because the way to build the tallest, uh, the quickest skyscraper isn't the way to build the tallest one because you spend more time building the foundations so that you could obviously build it higher and that kind of thing. And, and it'll have that, longevity to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think when we talk about some of the like <laughs> different curveballs that have been thrown your way in the last few months since moving out here, your ability to withstand those and come out of them stronger is largely dictated by the years of experience beforehand in terms of actually understanding how on earth this drop shipping thing works and like how you can maybe circumvent some of these issues and, and, and overcome them and i wonder what was it about drop shipping that attracted you in the first place because you tried a few things before after fit quint football yeah so in terms of drop shipping like it's quite low barrier of entry um which is like you can start with relatively nothing um and like i say starting out i didn't have much i obviously i grew up in a council house um which a lot of people don't actually know is in uh, knightswood which is obviously a place in glasgow um but then i moved obviously i moved house but started off there my mum was a dinner lady my dad's just regular joiner and so i didn't have much money or much capital to start and obviously you do your research online you see the, the standard business models drop shipping amazon affiliate marketing and the original plan was to do Amazon. However, you need upfront cost, you know, for your stock and your inventory. Um, and so drop shipping is the same sort of um, business model as e-commerce. However, it's the way that you sort of supply the orders and the fulfillment is is cheap, is cheaper. Um, and hence why I went down the drop shipping. Less route. But, fiscal exposure. Yeah, exactly. But bef even before the drop shipping, I tried a couple of things um, in terms of like reselling shoes or even just, you know, their generic selling sweets in school, FIFA coins, all that kind of thing. I always loved like, selling something and, and making a profit that was like kind of my passion it, it, it still gives me a buzz today it doesn't matter if it's a five or a tenner it's it, it feels good it depends how you're wired and people need to recognize that as well equally i've spoken to people who have not had like an entrepreneurial flair during their school years but then something they found the vehicle and that's one of the terms that you and i talk about a lot the right vehicle is so so important to apply your skill set within and i talk lots on the podcast that i've been really successful in my sales career the last few years after moving industry from insurance into design-led furniture because the vehicle was just bigger ba bigger and better in the same way if you'd start with amazon we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about the sort of numbers that you're going to start to talk to us about because you didn't have those startup costs to enable you to speak to the factory get samples do the fulfillment whereas drop shipping was a vehicle that made more fiscal sense and had a more tangible return for somebody that had the startup capital you had yeah 100 percent. like we always talk about is the vehicle so the boat you're in matters more than the boat that you're, you're sailing in, do you know what I mean? Um, or the size of the boat kind of thing, because like you could be the hardest working person in the world. However, if you're working on the wrong thing, it's never got to work. And the analogy I like to use, um, and that I also like say most of my sort of one-on-one -on -one clients, is it's like digging for gold. And so 
you could be digging for gold, but if you're digging where there's none, you're never going to find it. And that's what I, I call it a 95, do you know what I mean? It's, you have to put in all the work and at the end of the day, what do you get? A 1% job increase, or if you're lucky, do you know what I mean? Um, year to like, year, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, your yeah. salary. You did really well this year, here's 1%. Here's Inflation's a, running yeah. at 10%, so you're exactly. getting swallowed straight yeah, away. Here's, here's a pat on the back, go make me more money next year. That's, that's kind of what it is, but um, I so in terms of the drop shipping, I always knew that, look, it was something that, would work out because I've seen people online, mainly Americans, um, like, I feel like that's why people relate to myself is because I'm not gonna say I'm Scottish, the only Scottish person doing something, but I'm from the UK. And so in the UK, it's not really as popular. Um, like we, no one really does not not no one, but it's not a lot of people. It's more common in America, isn't it? It's more like a hustle culture. Um, and so that's why I think people relate to myself more nowadays um, in terms of like- They can draw the lines between where you're at and where they're at potentially because they can pitch themselves in your circumstances whether it's from a particular part of glasgow or a particular education or maybe they had a sports background yep. and they applied in another place there's something they can draw tangibly like you say if you're watching these guys in america it can sometimes feel like a million miles away both in terms of geography but also in terms of like how I, how to connect with this person yeah exactly 100 percent. i feel like i'm very relatable in the sense that uh, I act the same, I speak the same, even when I had nothing. And now like, it, I think it shows in my content. Um, I'm quite raw off the cuff. I don't have any fancy edits or a big team or, do you know what I mean? All the stuff that you do see with the American YouTubers or the people who do drop shipping, who I tend to find like the bigger the drop, sh uh, the bigger the YouTuber or the bigger the, their, their social media presence is, the less they're actually good at business. Because I know from personal experience, and you probably know yourself, if you actually want to become like one of the best in the world that whatever it is you do, you need to like be all in. You need to have like blinkers on. Um, and so if you're trying to do YouTube on the side or maybe a bit of this and that, then it's you're diluting your attention. And if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch none. And so in the sense that, look, you need to be fully focused. And that's why I spent the best part of four and a half years doing drop shipping myself before I started even telling people I'd done it or, or helping people with it. And I think nowadays it's quite backwards. It's more like, right, how do I teach someone to do something that I've not actually done myself and kind of monetize it that way, if you, you know what I mean? You see it all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a crypto expert or I coach online coaches or I do whatever it is. And it's telling people how to do things that sometimes they've not done to the extent that they maybe explain that they have whereas when you've been in the arena like i talk about the man arena quite a lot it's like a it's a, it's a famous uh, i think it's roosevelt speech and it really does matter i respect the people who can tell me what they've done from their experience and apply it to where i am on my journey so let's say for example they're at point y on the alphabet and i'm at point c i want them to talk to me about e f g how am i how am i moving towards where you get to like can you remember what it was like when you were in my circumstances okay cool tell me what, like what was what were your experiences like then what did you do what did you focus on how did you improve and that for me is so much more valuable to me than somebody who is so far removed from me and can't remember those early days and just disregards my experience mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent. it's it is so important to learn from someone who's one done what you want to do that's one of my big philosophies is like look if you want to get in shape find out what that person done to get in that position and copy that because if someone has something you want that's that's good news in the sense that you can copy that and achieve the same results they're not any better than you um and so that was kind of my mythology in the sense that like look if i wanted to lose weight i'd let's say find out someone who's maybe lost a lot find out what they've done whether it be um do lots of cardio um edit their diet or whatever it would be and i would replicate that and so in the sense that like I've been able to generate seven figures in drop shipping, starting from zero. And I know that since I've done that, I can replicate that success. And so when people come in and sort of want to learn from myself, I know exactly the pain points that they're going through. I know that they, everyone you see online is American. I know that all the stuff they say makes it seem like it's, it's fake. And so when I speak to people, it's like, I know exactly what they think. And that's what makes like sales and anything. Same, even with drop shipping, like people think you just sell cheap, crappy products from China, whereas what you actually need to do is sell products that solve problems because no one actually wants to buy a product. What they want to buy is a solution to their problem. And so if you can position it like that, then you'll be able to make lots of money. You can sell lots of uh, lots of units. Um, and you do that by market research, understanding the buyer, because if you can understand the person and know their exact pain points, they'll buy whatever it is you're selling because they know that he must know exactly what I'm feeling. And so his solution must be the kind of perfect fix. And in terms of the products that I'm running just now, obviously I won't dis disclose the one that I'm running just now, but the first uh, product I ever ran was a sort of LED diffuser, which made your like room smell nice and all that kind of thing. And so when I marketed that, uh, when I marketed that, I didn't go down the traditional, like the show off couple of benefits. I actually 
found out the pain points of people, why do people buy diffusers, and I reverse engineered it, and that scaled up to 10k a month within two months, and then ultimately six figures in sales. Tell me, that. tell me about the story of when you first realised that dropshipping was going to work for you. So it was probably September 2021. Um, is well, I started dropshipping on my 16th birthday, so I've got an invoice. I still have it back in 2019, um, and maybe I was selling jewellery at the time as everyone does and it didn't really work out and I disregarded it as like drop shipping doesn't work but that's because I didn't work and that was a good lesson to learn early on is that look even though it was my best sometimes your best isn't good enough do you know what I mean it's like you, you don't need to do your best you need to do what's required um, because you're competing against not, when you run ads on Facebook and stuff, you're competing not just against other dropshippers, but against the biggest companies in the world. The like corporates Adidas, are running yeah, All the corporates. And so I, I tried it out and when I was 16, it didn't work. And then I started, basically forgot all about it. And when I was 18, like I say, I was in that position where, look, I ended up going down to the joinery sort of route and I knew that 95 wasn't for me. And so the whole time I was looking for an escape. So I ended up trying dropshipping again in 20, um, 2021, the end of 2021, um, in between the kind of lockdowns that were going on. And that's when I got my first sale. Um, I think it was £574 I made in the span of 24 hours for my first product going, uh, sort of going live. And that's when I knew like it has potential. And I, at the time I was making £150 per week. So that was like almost a Was month. this when you were doing your apprenticeship? This was, this was when I was doing the, the joinery, yeah. So I was, yeah. I was on peanuts, £150 a week went, went by. And, and in one day, 500 pounds come in yeah. from this one product 600 pounds um, and obviously i thought i was i was balling do you know what i mean i, I probably i had more of a buzz there than when i made 60k like previously i've, I've made 60k in a month it's the proof of concept I, exactly. so i've heard this story so many times like that first time where you get some, like some sort of validation and it's not that surface level validation where somebody says good job or yep. or likes your post on instagram it's that sincere proof of concept that what i've been working on is coming to fruition and that means so much more than like you say, further down the line where you've maybe just scaled it to a different level. Yeah, 100%. Like, starting out, it's... it's, it's the, way I, the way I like to look at it is, look, inputs, outputs, and then you've got your environment, and then it all stems from a positive feedback loop. So the feedback loop can be positive or negative. So if your inputs are in dropship, you need to find a product, create a store, run ads, and if your outputs are making sales, that generates a positive feedback loop, and that cycles back in uh, doing more of that, and that's why you get the buzz and let's say, the proof of concept like you just mentioned. However, if you spend all your time finding the product, creating a store, running ads, all the work that you need to do, and then your outputs are, it doesn't work, you don't make sales, that's a positive feedback loop. Uh, that, that's a negative feedback loop, sorry. And that cycles into drop shipping doesn't work. And you, and you never try it again. Um, and so, yeah. Oh, this that, is a scam. It doesn't exactly. work. The course that I bought has not got enough information. Or it, whereas you could be like, okay, well, actually, my ads were wrong. My market research was wrong. I could improve or iterate on some of these small factors and see a better result. Yeah, 100%. Like you say, it's, it's all about learning from what you've done and then making them iterations. Because, look, it might just be the smallest thing that you're missing. It's like it's not too difficult to find a product create a Shopify website and run ads it's, it's like these platforms Shopify, Facebook they make it as easy as possible and so the difference between actually making it and not making it is quite slim it's like even a nose and so for instance in the Grand National or even in the 100 metre sprints in the Olympics the difference between first, second and third is what a millisecond so or two small. but it's it's everything it's, it's all the prize money it's all the sponsorships and so it's them small details if you can find where you went wrong make iterations and keep doing that and it's that sort of constant um sort of iteration of doing that and that's how you get the sort of compounding growth and yeah up. a lot of people are like using the branding kaizen now there's a guy that was on the podcast called callum carver who has a, a newsletter called kaizen we've got the kaizen run club in glasgow yeah. which has become really popular and that's all about that small improvements each time and that compounding over the course of like years and months and whatever else as well that builds up towards that and i really think that when people start to try and master their craft and so september 2021 you, you get that notification through to say that a sale has been made and there's that excitement it doesn't really stop there because i think you i think you've shown me your, 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 your screenshots before where it's like 500 that first day and then within a couple of months it's up to 10 grand but you weren't just doing the same things to do 500 a day to do 10 grand a day it's, it, it had to evolve yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's all about sort of evolving and, and learning from why it worked and why it didn't. Because even though you might get a win, so to say I made £575, if I didn't know how I'd done that, 
then it, it wouldn't be beneficial. And one of my sort of phrases is, you're actually better to be um, aware of why you failed than to be ignorant of your success. Because if you, you don't know why you succeeded, you can't replicate it. However, if you know why you failed, you can adjust and sort of replicate your results. And so, yeah, uh, basically I made some money, was posting sort of content online, TikTok, Instagram. And then from the money I'd made there, I started learning how to run ads um, on Facebook. This, this was before... TikTok ads were a thing, but I was kind of getting into Facebook as that was around longer and I had sort of, it had more legs. And so learned how to do ads and that was probably something that changed my life. And generally it's like the thing with gambling is the favor is always in the house. That's why like even on the roulette wheel, there's always two greens. And so the edge is always in terms of the casino. Whereas with advertising, with enough skill and with enough practice, you have the opportunity to become the house. And every day for the past, as we mentioned earlier, two and a half years, I've been able to put in one pound and get five pounds out, like reliably. And obviously, if you can do that at scale, it, it transforms your life. That's incredible. What do you think it was about adverts that you just got straight away? So and for me, every business is two things. It's sales and marketing. And so one sales is you need something to sell and people to sell it to um, and obviously marketing's making people aware of it and so with advertising specifically facebook ads at the time like for me i thought i don't know it, it kind of clicked straight away i just always intrinsically knew like what people were thinking i feel like that's that was one of my strengths which applies to a lot of things in life was essentially like psychology like i'm quite aware of what people think and how they think and like we mentioned earlier if you can position your product as a solution to their problem then you can sell them anything and so yeah running ads like in the beginning i lost some money and um, you're going to lose money because you're learning but my advice would be to give yourself like a budget allocate yourself like a slush fund that you're willing to invest because it is an investment and if you never actually get skin in the game you're never going to learn you'll learn more by testing your product running your first ads than you will by watching a course on it or whatever um so i given yourself the uh, freedom to fail and like understanding that every failure is closer to a success um it's a prerequisite do you know what i mean um and so yeah i, I to be fair I, I, hit, I hit success quite quickly um with the ads i managed to scale up like i say that's that same store done 10k a month within the space of two months um and ultimately i've used them skills that i learned back then now to this very day to apply in a different product with a higher margin with a higher uh, revenue ceiling as well which is quite exciting that skin in the game piece is interesting because sometimes we don't care enough to go deeper and learn more until there's something more important on the line and skin in the game is that very much that isn't it there's something on the line that means something and even recently we both know don cameron from crypto glasgow he was on as a as an interview with just him rather than as a, a cg episode and he was talking about he'd heard about bitcoin like three or four times before he bought some xrp but as soon as he had some money in xrp and he could see it going green or red up and down that was when he was like right i better learn about this blockchain thing i better actually start watching more of these videos to understand what's happening and it was only a few hundred pounds but just by having some sort of investment, you have a more of an attachment to the outcome of it or your ability to control the outcome as well. And I think, having got to know you over the last couple of years, you're somebody that likes to have an element of control over the input so you can shape what might come out the other side. You can't have complete control of it, but you can give yourself the best possible chance. Yeah, 100%. Like you said, people that pay, pay attention. And so, for instance, I've taught lots of my sort of close mates or even like my girlfriend and stuff, like how to do drops, even my brother, I like put him on early days. Like this is how I've been able to, let's say, make minimum 10K a month. And here's how you can do it too. But since he didn't pay for it, like, and I just taught him how to do it for free, he got no results from it. Um, he didn't even try it because when you don't pay for something, you don't find it as valuable. I could sell the a dropshipping guide on the best thing ever, like how to do everything step by step. And if I put it on YouTube for free, no one would watch it. And if you did watch it, they wouldn't take action. Whereas if you pay for something and actually invest in it, you're more like willing to actually see it through because you want a return. No one wants to waste money. And not only waste money, they don't want to admit to themselves that they wasted it was like do you know what I mean it was their fault it didn't work they didn't sort of they have to take the responsibility of the pain and the burden Ex yeah absolutely it, it, it is funny because I think so many resources we have access to now for free are so so good but it takes a particular set of circumstances to combine in your life that if you don't have money already on the line you're not going to do anything with it because if I look at your journey some of the sources you were consuming, the likes of Gary Vee was somebody that was big for you, Hermosi, somebody that you, you, you quote when we when we talk quite a lot. These are all free resources, but there has to be other things going on inside your life for you to understand how to apply those. Whereas if you just tell your brother or a friend about dropshipping all of a sudden, 
and there's not enough in their life to push them towards it or they're running away from something that they want to get towards in terms of like you were hating the fact you were doing joinery like i've seen the photos of you like no, no money back in the day and just like hating life and just feeling unfulfilled that pushes you towards actioning the free content but but unless you have enough that makes that viable for you you are just going to coast along or just ignore the stuff that's freely available yeah absolutely like you said it's about running away from something and also running towards something and so if there's not enough pain or there's not enough of a reason as to to do it then you won't actually do it so looking back i was quite fortunate to be in the position i was in where i was earning 150 pound a week that isn't even i don't even know how anyone would live on that sort of nowadays but i was in such a bad position like financially and also the work it was it was terrible work and so that benefited me that I was in enough pain that I was like, I need to make this work. And so I therefore took action. However, if you're in a job and it's okay money, you know, you get you get paid enough to, to go to the trip to IB for, you can wear, you can buy the odd designer clothes or whatever, then you get comfortable and you end up, you know, you buy the car or you get the car in finance or whatever. And then you stay in that position. Trapped. Yeah, you, you, you stay trapped. Um, so it's, it's almost paradoxical. You're actually better off being in a worse position um, so that you can actually make that change. And There's a tipping point. A lot of people talk about this, like you might be in a relationship just now that it's okay, but you argue sometimes over stuff and it always comes up, but it's better than being single in your opinion whereas like you you have to sometimes sacrifice the good for the great and the great for the best and a lot of people really struggle with that paradox as you say so sometimes it's better that your circumstances worsen because it forces you to get yourself to escape from it in terms of the sources you were consuming i know you, you mentioned to me before that gary v was somebody that was really big and he's almost had a bit of a renaissance recently because he's just released his book attention which he's doing the rounds on podcast talking about as well what did you learn from him so yeah gary v was probably one of my not gonna say idols, but he was the first sort of person in entrepreneurship who was that I consumed. Um, I consumed all of his content, um, even when I was 15, 16, even 14. Um, and it was all about, you know, taking that chance. And most people, when they think about entrepreneurship, they think of starting the next Facebook or the next Uber or all these kind of things. Whereas his approach and his message was always, look, you can make a hundred grand a year flipping stuff on eBay. And so that was more relatable to me. I, I didn't I didn't want even to, to try and start this big company. I just wanted to make enough money so I didn't need to work a job and I could do what I want, where I want. And so that was one of the big sort of takeaways I took from him was to, to just start and start like, you don't need to have this end goal in mind, just try and make a pound or two, buy something for, for cheap and sell it for more expensive. Um, and yeah, Gary Vee was good. I still consume not as much of his content today, but let's say I'm more on obviously Hermosa now, which is more tactical stuff, but Gary Vee was massive for the mindset. I think we use different creators at different times. And I really think that's healthy. Um, one of the people that uh, has been really popular in the years of the podcast is Richard Dixon. And he learned a lot from Grant Cardone back in 2017, 2018. But he's probably not watching a lot of 10X content now because he took what he needed at the time, grew and grew and grew. Maybe the odd video will pop up and you'll be like, oh, I really liked how Grant put that. In the same way, you'll see Gary Vee now and you'll be like, really fond memories of what he taught you in the stages that you needed him at. And in the same way, I'll maybe look at different books that I've read at different points in my life and be like, oh, wow, like I really learned a lot from that book. But if I read it at 31 years of age in the position I'm in now, it wouldn't be as relevant to me and I wouldn't get as much from it. Yeah, 100%. Even going back to that, like about it's packing stuff up at the right times. Like one of the books that contributed a lot to my success was a book called The Secret, which is all about the law of attraction manifestation. And I can't actually remember how I found the book um, or whatever, how I came across it, but I found that book early. And so finding that book early and realizing that I had the power to create my life because ultimately you can create your life. Um, and so I knew that from an early age. And so finding that that young, that was probably a, a big breakthrough for me. However, maybe if I found that when I was to life went differently and I was 30 year old and I was stuck in a 95 that I hated, I'd probably just chuck that book in the bin. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's all about consuming the right information and at the right times um, to give you that sort of leg up. That deadly overlap, isn't it? In terms of the secret, some people discredit it, others swear by it and they get so much from it. You are somebody that really thinks clearly about what he wants to move towards, but also you said before, you go into the arena of football or karate, now drop shipping in business, as I'm gonna be really good at this, I'm gonna deliver, I'm gonna be the best. That has an expectation effect, which we were talking about, I interviewed David Robson recently, and he was explaining the power of the placebo effect, but also the nocebo effect. If you assume something's going to go well your body and your physiology and your mind actually react in alignment with that and so there is science there to back up how you perceive something's going to happen is more likely to come to fruition than not 
Yeah, one hundred percent. Like the most important thing in anything, like we say, I've obviously done football, karate, drop shipping, whatever it is I do. The thing that is that remains is the mindset, and so the mindset is all about your beliefs and believing in something's like you. You don't just like think it's got to happen. You like you don't have any doubts, and I think it's Hermosi's quote is like we question all of our beliefs except from the ones that we truly believe and those we never think to question. And it's so true. Like I've never actually had any doubts and if I was going to make it, if I was going to like, do you know what I mean? I always knew from the very early age, even before I had any type of money, that was going to be successful. And even when, like, we'll probably touch on later, some, I've had some issues with maybe my Facebook ad account getting banned or any sort of issues and my money went down to zero. I was never phased because I knew that it was going to work out. And so, yeah, I do think that the mindset is the most important thing. What do you think instilled that in you though, Mackenzie? I don't know. I think, to be fair, I think I was born born with it um i do think it's, it's obviously that nature versus nurture debate um i do think i was always kind of quite naturally like that but i'd say my dad um my dad always kind of sh- like he trained me um, in terms of everything so i like karate take me to the karate um football training me off season as well so his mindset was always pretty good um and he obviously instilled that in me so i think my dad and also just always like i say i always thought i was better than everyone um not in a bad way but i just yeah had that mindset because there's obviously actions, like you say, a lot of people don't actually believe in the law of attraction and all that kind of thing. They think it's a woo-woo or like hippie stuff or whatever. However, like without having the right beliefs, your beliefs dictate your worldviews. And so if you don't have the belief that look, drop shipping will work, then you won't actually go and try it. And so it, it all starts with a belief. And I do think that- The reason I'm so open to it, although I don't necessarily manifest often myself, is the number of people that cite it and the power of believing in it is actually far more important than if it actually is a thing. So by buying into it, by its very nature, you're giving yourself the opportunity to benefit from the concept. And I've been lucky enough, the last time I was in Dubai, I came back in March, it was in David Lloyd, and your old man came over and said hello and we were chatting away. And he was talking about your time doing karate and football and all the effort you kind of put in as a team together to move in the right direction. And he said, whenever you did something, you did it with everything. And you really gave yourself the best possible chance of doing it as well. And I have a fantastic relationship with, with with my family and I really swear by like the position they've put me in and the opportunity they've given me. But he really just said that when you are determined, it's like nothing or else. So it's almost a little bit like quite obsessive about like understanding how things work and then deciding to go for it. And like even like accountancy, you all of a sudden got into that when you were having more of your tax troubles back in the UK. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like you say, it's it is about being obsessed. Um and I think you do need to be obsessed. A lot of people have bad connotations with obsession. They think it's bad. Um whereas yeah, if you want to be the best at anything, you need to be obsessed and putting in the work when no one else is. But one of the kind of phrases or whatever that I live by is, look, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And a lot of people have heard that quote, but most people focus on the sort of first half of it. Like most things aren't actually worth doing. However, if it is, then it's worth doing to the very best. And if you treat, for example, I keep going back to drop shipping because that's how I made my money. But look, if you treat drop shipping like a side hustle, that's what most people do, then you'll get side hustle results. And if you you need to go all in and that's when i went all in and going back to another book was turning pro like you need to turn pro i was making a lot of money um and i had i I, I wouldn't say i was pro i would wake up at different times i'd eat whatever i wouldn't have any sops any systems any team and i was still winging it and when i actually went right let me actually turn pro and start turning this into something legitimate that's when i was able to scale up and hit two back to back 200k months um at the start of this year and so it, 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 it is a lot to kind of... That's Stephen Pressfield, isn't it? Yeah, Stephen Pressfield. Yeah. Really, really wise guy. And I actually see that in lots of other areas. If you treat your pursuit like an athlete would, so when you were playing for Thistle, you probably nailed your meal the night before, you got to early to bed, you got up before the game, you did your stretching or whatever else well so that you performed well. So many people have ambitions of being like the top of like whatever field they're in. But if they don't treat the... 23 hours around it or the the hours in advance of it during the week with the same level of respect then they're unlikely to perform in the same way if i think about podcasting i do a lot of research for my guests i do a lot of prep i've worked on my delivery and my enunciation and my my energy and my tone and these are all things that contribute to me having better quality interviews now whereas if i didn't practice that in private I wouldn't show up as well in public. And I think that speaks to a lot of what you've turned on to do as well. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Like you say, it's, it is all about the private victories, the stuff that you don't see. Um, like I spend, well, not as much now. And now I'm obviously in Dubai and living the life, but 
back when I was getting started out, it was me at the desk and my boxers <laughs> working till the early hours. And obviously I'm not gonna post photos of that. Do you know what I mean? That was maybe when it was still one to come up, but now, nowadays obviously I'm sort of posting more and showing the lifestyle and that's the public victories that people see. And so that's that's what I was going back to. Like people see that and they don't understand what's went into it. Um, and I do think that preparation is, is massive. Like we obviously touched on, like even just 20 minutes of preparation can make you seem like a genius compared to having zero. And so if you're truly prepared for something, it prevents like poor performance. And that's, what I, that's kind of my motto. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. And so- A lot of peas there, but I, compl I completely <laughs> agree. And these things are cliched, but a lot of cliches carry weight because they've been proven over and over, and over, yeah. and over again. And some people are like, oh, it's a cliche, but you're like, no, it's a cliche because it's proven. Like, let's like live by some of these things a little bit more and just and, and, and just go with it. I guess in terms of touching on like the growth, you had that 10K month, November 21, things started to scale from there. You found a new product and it started to rise. It does look like an overnight success, but the sheer ability to scale within dropshipping is why so many people maybe message you nowadays and be like, bro, how do I do this? What is it about the industry that just allows for such headroom? Yeah, so the good thing about e-commerce is obviously the clues in the title is e-commerce, it's online, it's on the internet, it's selling goods or services. And so if you're selling in person, you're limited to one amount of time in the day and two, how many people you see. However, if it's on the internet, you can target anyone in the world at any time and at any point in time. And so it's infinitely scalable in the sense that it's in order to make more money. If you have something that works, you just put more money behind it in terms of ads or you post more content and your results will sort of maintain. And so I think with dropshipping, the key is, there's a few keys, but the first one would be having a winning product, something that people want to buy. You don't want to be selling something that people want or a crap product um, because ultimately the most important thing is the product and you don't make sales to get you don't get customers to make sales you make sales to get customers so people will come back and buy again and that's how you build that sort of brand and ultimately the exit value. just before we move on that is such a huge point if you get somebody the acquisition cost of getting somebody to buy from you once is relatively high in terms of time energy potentially money as well on ads if you give them a good experience they're going to keep coming back and back and back and back that is MRR, monthly recurring revenue, or whatever cycle it is that these people pay you money at or buy your product at. That's something that we're all really striving for. Whereas too many people focus on that top of funnel, let's get somebody through once and it's one and done. Yeah, 100%. To be fair, I, f I fell victim to that when I was first starting out. It was just, how can I make sales um, for as cheap as possible? Um, sort of neglecting the product uh, quality and that kind of thing. And like you say, CPMs are only increasing, which is the cost of advertising. So if that's only going one way, the only way to mitigate that is word of mouth. And you do that by having a good product or having a good service. And so that's something I've learned more as I've, as I've matured as an entrepreneur is actually having a product that's that you think is amazing and so if you do have that you'll have so much conviction um, in what you're selling and people will be able to uh, first of all you they'll feel that in your market message but also once they buy it they'll they'll feel good and they'll tell their friends and it, it goes on kind of thing and obviously like i say i've got a sort of i don't have a course or anything but i take on one-on-one -on -one clients and um, not even too many I, I don't sort of need the money and i also don't need want a job so i just take on a handful and whenever i speak to people like i don't do any sales or anything what i do is i just say to them look I was in your position and I know with so much conviction that my stuff works. Like you can look at my, my lifestyle just now and you can look at the proof of me four years ago when I was on the building sites earning nothing and now I'm here making seven figures sitting in Dubai. So the proof's there and I know that I've been able to do it and so I've got so much conviction um, in what I do and I think that's probably the secret is having something that you actually truly believe in and it comes across. And you can back up. Yeah, and you, yeah, you can back up. A lot of people sort of they shy away and they can't don't have maybe don't have the, the proof. A lot of people, like we were mentioning earlier, they try and talk about something without any proof that they've done it. Embellish a backstory to make it sound a bit more fun or a bit more exciting, a bit more edgy. And that's cool. Like like you say, like you could have been like, oh, actually uh, I came from the council state and like I had this terrible experience, whatever <laughs> else as well. That's like, that's cool. Like you were like, oh yeah, I lived in the council state and I moved to another house and then I went to school and whatever else as well. Like it's it's like, you're you're not coming from like absolutely nothing, you're, but you're not coming from a, a hand up or a leg up yeah. to, to get you to where you are. Like it's all relative. And when you turned on that, education piece in terms of having those one-to-one -one clients as well we actually did speak about at first that like, you almost felt like you were having to sell it but in the same way you're speaking there when you were your most authentic clear self about like what i'm bringing to the table in terms of value you've actually got more people wanting to work with you than when you're maybe saying like oh guys dm me start and then almost having to do like a, a hard closed because I, I don't think that's your energy either yeah no 100 percent like you say 
when I was doing my old drop shipping, like so this year or the first quarter of Q1, it done I think I've done about half a million revenue. Um and my profit margin on my stores is around forty percent. Um so it's a lot of money. That's um, a lot for drop shipping as well, isn't it? Because I've sp- I've spoken to Amazon guys in the podcast, not drop shippers, and the percentage is like sometimes sub ten percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. And drop shipping, or I suppose any online business, like we we're chatting about earlier with the likes of Gymshark and stuff, it's it's easy to be on paper saying, "Oh, I'm making X amount in revenue," but it all comes down to the bottom line because, like, revenue is is vanity, and like you say, profit is sanity. And it's true, and it's cliche again, but um, the only thing that matters is how much you're actually making. And I didn't get into drop shipping or to to try and show off how much money I'm making. I'd got into it so I could live a life and you only do that by making profit. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of the numbers, like my margins are quite um, quite good in the sense that I'm, I'm able to scale by that because, and, well, I go back to Facebook ads, like Facebook ads won't scale a business. A good business will scale Facebook ads because if you if you have a product that you can sell for 10,000, you can spend up to 10,000 to get that sale. However, if you're selling a cheap crap product for a fiver, you can only spend five pounds to get a customer and you probably aren't going to do that. That, that's so true because that that's creating your slush fund and your uh, advert fu- advert fund that's going to enable you to push to the next level because you could you could just cycle around in that pool of particular income level that you're at forever and ever and ever if you never give yourself tools to go to the next level as well yeah 100 percent. you need to give yourself like the right you need to give yourself the opportunity to succeed and one of my phrases is like make it so difficult to fail that it becomes easy to win and so if you're only giving yourself, if you don't give yourself any money to invest in a course or invest in products or in advertisements, you're never going to win. So you, you, you've chopped your leg off from the get go. So yeah, you need to give yourself the opportunity to win. And obviously, I've already won in the sense that I've, I'm already doing what I want to do. But I get, I moved to Dubai because I wanted to make more money, and so I elevate. And by doing that, I've placed myself in a position to win even more. So the way I look at it is like, if you stand outside long enough, you're going to get wet. It's going, it's going to rain eventually so you need to put yourself in them positions and obviously we, t- we touched on earlier um off the off the podcast is like proximity is power like it's massive who you hang around with and most people know that look you will be the average of the five friends that you hang around with which is cliche but people hear that and they just carry on with their life they still cut about with the same five same friends. drinking partners same guys that go to gaff till four in the morning every weekend and wonder why they, they feel terrible monday tuesday like it's it's really really obvious but only when you step outside your programming. Like I talk a lot on the podcast and people be laughing into their AirPods and into their car stereo just now. But if you live life on autopilot, you will drift and you'll wake up at 30, 31, 40 and be like, how did I end up here? But you were directionless. You were just being driven along by the tide or the, 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 the course of the flow of the water and you didn't give yourself the opportunity to to change tack or to make it make it make a variation in which direction you were going. And I think people who'd spend time typically listening to podcasts like this one are those that want to detach from the mainstream reality and that's not to shit on some of the uh, fantastic success you can have in that space if you live with an alignment. But so many people are just plugged in and I hate using the term the matrix, but they are just completely zoned in and not allowing themselves the opportunity to pause, reflect, and decide, actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different that's going to make me happier. 100% Colin. I think, I can't remember the book, it might be Thinking Grow Rich or whatever, but I remember I was driving along, um, and back in Glasgow, I was driving along, and I, I remember it so vividly. It was a bit in the audiobook that said, if you ever find yourself on the side of normality, pause and take time to reflect. And at that whole time, I thought, well, I'm this genius, I'm better than everyone, I'm this, that. However, if I looked at my actual life, I was the same as everyone else. I worked a nine to five. I I took thirty holidays a year, and that was my life. I I wasn't anything else. So I found myself on the side of the the majority, and it's impossible to be exceptional or by doing by by do, just doing what everyone else does. And so that's that's something that I, I realised. And so that's when I did take time to pause and reflect. And like you say, no one does that. No one takes time to think. No, they just they go about their life like an accident and they wonder why it, nothing's working out because no one gets to the top of no matter as by accident or by luck it takes dedicated focus and, and time under tension time under the bar and not just like doing it and buying going through the motions actually like taking the time to properly do it because obviously there's the 10,000 hour uh, rule which is obviously 10,000 hours and you become an expert in whatever field it is however I think there's another study on that that's like it's not just 10,000 hours it's 10,000 focused hours where you're giving it 100% your phone's locked away and you're actually putting your all into quality it. matters yeah people always talk about this with the podcast and you always see me sh- share the stat like 90% of podcasts have failed by episode 8 and then another load of fall away before, before episode 21 so most people don't keep going 
but you could keep going and just keep producing. But if the quality never improves, if the conversation, the types of questions you ask your guests, the research you've done, maybe the mic quality, the camera quality you're using, then you are keeping going and you are being consistent, but you're not iterating on the quality of it. So you're never going to see those exponential growths. And if you look at the, the journey of this podcast and being able to come out to Dubai and do interviews as well, that's not possible unless I work on my craft. So if you go back and listen to episode three or four or five, you'd be like, oh, Colin's a bit more clear now, or his guests are of a, a higher standard or they're more um, successful in whatever field they're in. But that's just by nature of improving over time rather than just keeping going blindly. Like we can use a gym example. I could just go and do the same weight on bench press for five years my chest will stop growing at some point because i'll just get used to the stimulus whereas i'm eventually going to need to progressively overload and take on more and get better at it yeah 100 percent. it's obviously the quantity is important that's what i mentioned at the start like volume is the answer however time is the ingredient and by doing enough quantity the quality will come and so i think there was a study i obviously might butcher this but there was a study um in like university where it was like two sort of test groups they got one of them to it was like a, a pottery class so make the perfect piece of pottery and at the end you'll get assessed on how good it was so obviously most people think the quality group will have the best and then the other group was given create one piece per week and at the end of the year we'll see what one's the best and every single one of the quality the quantity group had better than the quality because by doing the repetitions and by doing the sort of constant iterations they, they became better and so like you say the bar is so low what is it one percent a podcast make it what three episodes or whatever it is yeah like the bar is so low in anything most people are fat most people can't bench 100 kg most people don't make 10k a month and it's once you actually do it you realize how easy it is and that's something i've realized like the more i do the more i realize i can do and if i look back at anything i done or anything i done initially in terms of like my, my first work my first youtube videos or my first like creatives on facebook they're shocking like and i at the time i must have thought that's good but it's only by looking back i realize how bad they were and it's just by like i say that's probably the secret to achieving infants putting the work and just constantly improve like over and over and over, and over, over. again yeah you moved to dubai you put yourself in proximity with people that could help you grow your network we've met lots of really interesting people out here in the time that i've been out here with you and you've worked probably harder than ever before in terms of what i'm seeing but there's been a few curveballs while you've been here that have made things not quite as smooth what stands out so yeah since like since being here it's obviously been amazing i'm like, blessed to be here blessed to be in this position um that i've been able to do this at such a young age but like we touched on earlier, I do believe in the universe, whether you want to call it God or the universe or the law of attraction. It's it's definitely true. And for me, since coming here, obviously there's more stuff to post. There's lifestyle, there's the restaurants, there's the fast cars, there's the watches. And so by posting that, I've, well, let's say I've been, it's opened my mind into as to the level of welfare. And it's given me that abundance mindset, which I didn't used to have. I used to be quite scarce mindset. But since coming here, I think the universe has kind of leveled me out. As Since moving here, I've just had uphill battle uphill battle after uphill battle in the sense that my stripe account got closed down by accident um so i think i think i, think I had eight thousand pounds on that i got shut down completely gone my facebook ad account which i was spending three and a half thousand pounds per day on shut down made my revenue go to zero um, and bear in mind your facebook ad account you're aiming to spend a pound get five back generate those hundreds of thousands of pounds a month so it's it's terrifying when that happens yeah it's, it's absolutely terrifying especially if you're paying four and a half thousand pounds a month on rent and you've got a certain lifestyle that you live and instantly overnight that shut down to be fair looking back i could have done things differently which i've got in place now but that is all part of learning now i've got backups of one backups of one backups um even in terms of maybe facebook accounts or even in terms of payment processors it's all about being prepared and like i say that money was taken away from me because i must have not been ready for it and that's something that I find is true is like, if you aren't ready for a certain amount of money, you won't either get it or it will be taken from you. The same with, I've had a conversation with a few people and they've said, oh, I'm doing all the right things. The money just hasn't caught up to me yet. And my answer to that is, look, you probably aren't as good as what you think you are. Because if you were that good and you were this clever, you'd have the money. It's, it's not like- The stats wouldn't lie. Yeah, the universe is very rewarding. I've never seen anyone who's actually truly wanted something go out and, and not get it. Like. If you every day woke up, trained twice a day in terms of the gym example, trained twice a day, progressive overload, it counted your calories, done all your steps, after a year, two years, you would be in shape. It's not, you might be in shape, you might not, it's 100%. However, most people say they've tried it, whereas what they're doing is they don't have any plan um, and it's just excuses. But I think if you truly do want something, then you can go and get it. And even when my uh, Stripe account got shut down, I kind of just forgot about it or whatever, but I, I realized like, 
I've not actually tried, so I, I kept trying to get it back every day, email and email, and then eventually I got it back. It was just a mistake on their end. Um, but yeah, in terms of that, I think that was just the universe to sort of try to balance me out. I was getting maybe because too high. getting too high. Do you think so? I think so in the sense that I don't know. I've never been someone to show off in terms of what I have. To be fair, it might look like that from the outside perspective, especially like maybe from what I wear or the watches or the the jewelry and stuff. But generally, I spend like one percent, well two to five percent of what I actually make so I'm actually I live well below my means even back in Glasgow um, I've just got a standard Mercedes AMG line um, to be fair I did buy it cash but lots of my mates or lots of people I know oh, I've got better cars than me they're more and heavily leveraged that's a key thing that happens in Glasgow as well it, yeah exactly it's all about sort of like the leverage and I'm not trying to sort of play this persona because I could be cutting about in a Fiat Punto or whatever that my brother used to drive and I'd still feel the exact same because I don't need to make up for anything or any insecurities. And I do tend to find, obviously that's what people that have them kind of things maybe try and do. However, let's say I'm probably going to be buying a Lamborghini in the next couple of months, but like that's just part and parcel of it. I think um, maybe it was a take clip. It said like truly rich people, it was someone saying to take like truly rich people don't drive Lamborghinis or don't show off their money. Then his answer was, then, then who's buying the Lamborghini? <laughs> Lam Wealthy people are buying them because so, they want to. Yeah. And as I think as a percentage of income is an interesting thing to recognize because with the kind of business that you have from an education standpoint now as well, it is valuable for you to showcase the level of lifestyle you can unlock. And that's all relative. Some people might not want the particular lifestyle you've got, but they might want a percentage of it. Yep. And that's cool too, because then they can put in a percentage of the effort and the percentage of the focus or the percentage of the type of business. But if you didn't have that on show, then it would be very, very hard. And uh, last time I was out, you and I sat in the studio to interview Joseph Rakic, and he talked about his joint wealth network. And guess what? He has the, 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 the gold day date and he's got the, the Lamborghini and the G-Wagon and people are more willing to listen to what he's got to say because he has the hallmarks of success. While, of course, enjoying those as well, whereas some people, they don't actually enjoy what they're purchasing and it's maybe a bit more of a, a functional transaction. Yeah, 100%. Like, for me, perception is reality. Um, and so if you look like you have money, and you're trying to teach, maybe give advice on how to make money, you better as well look like you have it because no one's got to listen to you if you look like you're broke. And it's the same with a, a sort of tactical example or a more real life example is like, if you want to get in shape, you're going to find a PT who looks in incredible shape, not a fat one, because if they knew what they were talking about, wouldn't they, they themselves be in shape? And so if I'm going to teach people how to make money and how to make money by dropshipping, I would be as well making a lot of money by doing dropshipping myself. Um, and so yeah, I do think perception is reality. And that was something that maybe my dad kind of taught me as well, is about social media. It's like, his example was always, if you see someone's Instagram and they have maybe six posts all wearing a, all wearing a Celtic t-shirt, what team do they support? You assume Celtic. Yeah, you would assume Celtic. However, they could be a Rangers fan. They could be a Partick Thistle fan. But to the naked eye, to the, the world, they've put out the image that I'm a Celtic fan. And so you can sort of manipulate that in a sense. And I think that's what a lot of people do. Um, it's easy to do that in Dubai, especially, you know yourself. You come here, um, you, you go economy in, in British Airways, you come here, stay out in the middle of nowhere, drive to get a taxi in front of the Burj Khalifa photo, fo Burj Al Arab photo. And you, and you post on Instagram as if you're this big baller where... Everyone, you've, you've done it on the cheap, yeah. but you've, you've tried to show off... Um, all flash, yeah. all, all for coat, no knickers. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I feel like that's everyone, especially on my Instagram, I don't know what it's like for yourself, but it feels like everyone's successful and everyone's making money. And I said to my girlfriend like a couple of weeks ago, like, if everyone's making this money, how come I'm the only person here? I don't know any, anyone else here doing what I'm doing. And so I do think a lot of it on social media take with a massive pinch of Himalayan salt, but like, I, I feel like if everyone was making the money they said they were, then they'd be in this position. And let's say I, I kind of prove it and the way I live and the, what, the stuff I buy and the kind of lifestyle I live. So yeah, it's massive. How are you finding settling into having this level of income for a longer period now? Um, to be fair, it's it's never really been about the money and I've never actually like realized the money. I've never actually been big into like crypto or um, all that kind of thing, but it's, it's like realizing your gains, isn't it? Like you can make money. So all the money I'd made from drop shipping, I hadn't really spent. And so it felt like I'd never actually realized my, my, my profits or whatever. And so the only time I actually started spending money was when I flew first class here and obviously got my apartment and stuff. So this has been the first time I've actually spent like a lot, what I would consider a lot of money. Um, and so I do think it's it's been good. And one thing, I, or one key takeaway that I would give you is that by spending this money, I've actually made more. 
And so that comes down to the law reciprocity. It's like the more you spend, or no, not the law reciprocity, sorry. The law reciprocity is like, as you give and you get. So if I if I went out for a coffee with you and I said, look, I'll get it, don't worry. You'd in, like instinctively say, I'll get the next one because yep. you feel indebted to me. Um, but going back to that, it's like the law of abundance. And so like the more money you spend, the more money you attract. And that's been entirely true in every aspect of my life. Anytime I've ever tried to, cheap out on anything whether it be a cheap camera or a cheap tripod it's always broke and i've had to do you know what i mean i've had to buy a new one however if i've ever went right fuck let's, let's rent a lamborghini or let's let's do this or let's go on that nice holiday it's always paid for itself 10 times over it's or, come back around yeah it comes back around yeah massively i think it, for your age and your level of experience i think that's a really healthy perspective for you to have and i also think it's quite refreshing that you've talked about as a percentage of your income as well because i do think some people it's it's all out there and they're just hoping the law of abundance kicks in because it maybe won't be instant either. Yeah, 100%. Like you say, it does take time. Obviously, I spend a lot of money nowadays, but you don't want to be spending money if you don't have it. Do you know what I mean? I, I do think it is important to allocate a percentage that money you're willing to spend, whether it be on the slush fund to invest or just on enjoying life because at the end of the day, why are you in business or why are you working a job? It's to make money and it's not just to make money, it's to give you that money to give you freedom. So the reason I got into dropshipping and all this in the first place was for freedom and to make money to so that I could live my life. However, I started getting more involved in dropshipping and all I did was just look at numbers on a screen going up and not actually use the money to live my life. And so I do think it is it's healthy to, to take money and spend money um, because we are, we're, we are able to do it, especially if you learn skills um, the ones that dropshipping will teach you, such as marketing, sales, product fulfillment, customer service. There's a lot of skills that are involved in sort of getting started with dropshipping. And so having all of them, I know that I'll never go broke because I could spend 10K, 100K, whatever, or, or even a million, and that'd be completely fine because I now have the skills to replicate that success. And I think it was a Jim, Jim Ron quote. You know, um, I think he's, he's pretty good. I think he's obviously passed away now, but his quote was like, become a millionaire, not for the money you'll get, but for the person you'll become. And so when, then, then once you get the money, you can give it away because you're now able to make it. And so I think that was something that, re when I heard that, it really resonated with me. Um, and I think it would maybe look Belmar as well. It said that if you want to make a million pounds, you better make sure you're a millionaire. Because let's like say if you win the lottery, maybe you might become a, like, you might make a million, but you're not a millionaire. And so the money will go, you end up spending it. They don't know why they got it. I actually found that, um, I've not interviewed anyone who's been at this, but I've heard other interviews where some people have seen like a, a pump from like a, like a meme coin in crypto and they've almost not felt deserving of the money and they've just fritted it away in the same way most lottery winners go broke or bankrupt not long afterwards because they haven't felt like they've earned it. Yes, they bought a ticket for the raffle, so to speak, by buying the coin or by buying the, the lottery ticket, but they didn't actually put in the effort to feel like it was worth it. In sharp contrast, when you got the £500 notification when you were out at Sanctuary Sunday back in 2021, you were like, wow, this feels unreal because you'd been putting in the graph before it. So there was a different reward circuit that was triggering your brain that meant that you were maybe more likely to use that money for something more longer term than those immediate gratification awards because easy come easy go. easy go yeah 100 percent. and let's say when i did make that first sort of 500 pound on my first day like i'd worked a hell of a lot harder in the past for a hell of a lot less um and so like yeah when i was earning 150 pounds a week i was it was like proper like 12 14 hours a day like ripping out toilets all that kind of thing and then to go from now in the position to when i landed here um in january i got off the flight and i'd made eight point four thousand pounds and, and sales and then profit on that is around three and a bit thousand and so i'd made what would previously be like i don't know two or three months salary in a single day by doing nothing and so like we mentioned earlier hard work is a massive contributing factor but it comes down back to the vehicle like what you're working on is more important than how hard you're working because if it was down to hard work alone people like my mum or my dad would be millionaires they'd be rich nurses in the nhs would be on more money than lots of other people because of the, the graph that goes into that yeah 100 percent. it's like you see all the, the crypto boys or whatever and all they're doing is out partying they're not working hard but they're working on the right things and like credit to them they're they're switched on enough to do that whereas people look at that and oh do you know what i mean they'll, they'll sort of have a bad sort of connotation with that but um yeah i do think hard work is obviously important um but when people say to me like, oh, you can't outwork me or whatever, I think that's a bad mentality to have because you can definitely outwork me now in the sense that like, I don't actually do a hell of a lot. Um, but I think that's a dumb kind of 
like outlook to have hard work is important but what you work hard on if i could like nail one thing through is um like what you work on is more important it's so important i, I do think there's periods when we've been connected that you've been in like proper graph mode like the first time when i came back out to buy in march you'd had like days where you pretty much weren't going out at all and you were just laptop 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 building 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 and then the balance is slightly swing back and there's a phrase that i learned from daniel Priestley when i was out here interviewing before the pendulum always swings back and sometimes you have to go to the extreme of the monk mode graft to then go back to some sort of equilibrium albeit the other side is like party and recklessness and and not grafting at all yeah 100 percent. like you say the pendulum does always swing and um, to be fair i'm probably discrediting myself in the sense that i say that i don't work hard like to me it doesn't feel like hard work and that's probably why i don't because I love it, I love entrepreneurship, whether it's anything from dropshipping or even just reselling a shoe, anything, I just, I love it. And so to me, it doesn't feel like work, it feels like play. However, if you're just doing it for the money, it feels like I work for you and that's why you won't be successful in it. Um, and like I think I mentioned to you earlier, like there's a Jordan documentary uh, called, I think it's Michael Jordan to the Max. Um, and in the documentary, there's like all parents and stuff asking them, look, Michael, what's the secret to becoming successful, the best basketball in the world? What's the best routine? What's the optimal strategy? All that kind of thing. And his answer is just fall in love with the game. And so for me, the reason I've been able to achieve the kind of level I'm at is because I love it. I love just everything to do with it. Um, and so for me, it doesn't feel like work. I could be sat on my laptop 12 hours a day and it's enjoyable for me. However, if you maybe gave it to someone else, they'd, after doing it for 30 minutes, they give up because it's not enjoyable for them. Um, horses for courses, mate. We've all got different things we enjoy. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I'm quite obsessive in my personality. Um, I used to be quite big into video games as well. So I could sit there for 12 hours a day um, just playing the PlayStation or whatever. But I think now, obviously, I've changed. I'm not, I'm not doing that as Recognize much. Recognise how you're wired and lean into it. Mackenzie, that hour has flown past, mate. I've had so much fun, enjoyed chatting to you. We've got to know each other so well offline, but I think we've given the listeners a real sample into who you are and what you stand for. And I'm, there's no doubt we'll do another podcast again at some point in the future. If people want to continue the conversation with you, where should they head towards? So um, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is just my name, Mackenzie Halden. Um, that's my main channel. I've also got YouTubes and stuff, but if you want to contact me, drop me a DM on Instagram now. I'll, I'll get back to you. Those will both be linked in the show notes. Thank you to Mackenzie and thank, thank you to you. the listener. I'll be back to see you all again very, very soon.